podcast. Come here today on uh, this beautiful Friday down here in the ATL. We got a special guest here today, um, named by the name of Dawson B. T. Parker, who's running for a Superior Court judge, African American lady, who one of the first who's running. We never had African uh, African American lady, woman who ever ran for Gwinnett County Superior Court Judge. And we have her here today. And I've also known her for about 20 years from doing business with her in the past. Uh, we do. She's a commercial uh, real estate attorney as well as a litigation attorney. And my previous company, we've always did a lot of closes with her. So I know her very well. This is why I asked her to be a special guest on Pinpoint, Pinpoint Podcast today. I know we normally talk about commercial real estate and things about what Pinpoint does, but today well, let's make it about Miss D.T. Parker running for a Superior Court Judge in Gwinnett County. How you doing, Miss Parker? You want to introduce yourself? I'm fine. Thank you for having me today. I am B.T. Parker, and I am running for Gwinnett County Superior Court, and um, it's a court of general jurisdiction. Let me tell you why it's important to those of you who live in Gwinnett County as well as to those of you who live in Fulton and or DeKalb and the surrounding areas. If by chance someone owes you money and they live in Gwinnett County, the lawsuit will be in Gwinnett County. If by chance someone has a DUI and it's in Gwinnett County, regardless of where they live, the lawsuit will be brought here in Gwinnett County. So what goes on in Gwinnett County, it affects those in the surrounding areas and that's why it's really important to pay attention uh, to what goes on in the judiciary as well as the surrounding politics. So yes, I am running for Gwinnett County Superior Court and this election is extremely important for several reasons. Uh, one, in Gwinnett County we have never ever ever had a person of color elected to the bench and Gwinnett County is 200 years old this year so it is celebrating its bicentennial anniversary but we've never had a person of color on the bench, which is truly disconcerting considering the fact that Gwinnett County now has approximately a 49% minority population. So what that means is that people need to get out and they need to vote. People on the bench need to represent and look like the people that they serve. Okay, well then that's perfect. We hope all you guys out there in Gwinnett County, Atlanta, Georgia, and the surrounding areas um, took very close heed to that because y'all know about Gwinnett County and how the disparities uh, happens out here with pullovers and everything else. Leads me to a couple of questions that uh, I want to have to ask Miss Parker. So Miss Parker, one of the questions first I would like to ask is what made you want to leave your successful career as an attorney and run for Superior Court Judge in Gwinnett County? Well, I have been a practicing attorney for 22 years and now is the time for me to do something else to serve this community. As a practicing attorney, I've represented both plaintiffs and defendants, but again, I now want to serve Gwinnett in a different capacity. I have lived here for 22 years and um, Quite frankly, this is the county that I love and I chose to live in ever since moving here from Wisconsin. I have been a Gwinnett pro bono uh, legal aid attorney and uh, as many of you know, that's code for representing poor and underrepresented people who don't have the money to afford legal representation. I have also been a Gwinnett County truancy intervention attorney as well. So that is another uh, way in which I have served, to, I'm sorry, in which I have served Gwinnett County. I have also been an approved foster parent and still am uh, with Gwinnett County. And of course, uh, my husband and I have a 13 year old. So I have been a cheerleading coach uh, five years uh, in Gwinnett County. So this is the community that I love. It's a community that I want to continue to represent and serve and it's time to do something different. Gwinnett County has had a lot of growing pains, quite frankly. Um, it is the second largest county in, in Georgia um, in terms of population, Fulton being number one, Gwinnett being number two. So with that being said, we have growing pains and we need to be able to account for the people that we have here 
and tend to their legal needs. Our judicial system is overworked, quite frankly. At the Superior Court level, we currently have 10 different, um, 10 different judges, and an 11th should be coming um, within the next couple of years. So we need more judges on the bench. We also have inefficiencies. And let me tell you just a little bit about that, JL. Uh -huh. um, because of the growing pains we have had, we don't have, for instance, electronic filing. And a lot of the outlying counties do have electronic filing. We don't. Um, you can, for the most part, get a divorce quicker in Fulton County than you can in Gwinnett County. So it's inefficient uh, here in Gwinnett County. We do not have pretrial procedures um, or uniform pretrial procedures in place amongst the different judges. So that too has been problematic. And justice delayed is justice denied. Um, and in its most simple form, for instance, if someone is not getting a divorce as quickly as they would like to, they are not having their justice and the two people are still married for a much longer time than they want to be. But that transfers over into the criminal arena and into other civil cases. So we do need to have some um, more efficiencies in place. Um, as an attorney, over the last 22 years, I have worked in about 100 of the 159 counties. So I plan to bring that efficiency here to Gwinnett County. Ooh, okay. Well, I see you've been in Gwinnett County for a while. Of, of course, my business happened as well. That's where we started. That's where we met. Absolutely. Which brings me to the second question. If and when you win, let me say that now. If and when. I claim if it and receive and it. When, I do. That's right. When you win, you will be named the first African American woman to sit on the sit on the, um, one of the seats in Gwinnett County. How will you make a difference in the community of Gwinnett County as a Superior Court judge if and when you're elected? Well, first of all, um, let me break that question down two different ways. Uh, let's talk about Gwinnett County being the highest court, um, Superior Court, and um, again, it is the court of general jurisdiction where we hear felonies, uh, we hear murders, we hear robberies, we hear child molestation, divorces, personal injury, um, title to land. So we have a lot of different things that we hear. Again, it's a court of general jurisdiction. So it's a very important court. It's the most powerful court in the county because it is the, count, the court in which the judges can take away life and liberty or they can um, restore or do reformative justice. Um, it's the case, it's the court in which judges can take away someone's children or maintain familial harmony. So we need to understand how important it is, how this particular court, how important this particular court is. Uh, with that being said, as a judge, not only will I bring um, diversity to the bench, and let me back up for a second. Diversity means a lot of things. We immediately think of ethnicity, but diversity can mean a diversity of ideas, background, experiences, um, as well as ethnicity. And so as the first, um, I would bring at least racial diversity, which is something that's extremely important. Um, I have an article here that I brought. Um, this was from the Daily Report, which was printed on February 27th. And Chief Justice Leah Ward Sears had indicated in this article, in the state's courts, Sears said 70 to 80 percent of the judges are white men. White men are not 70 to 80 percent of the people in Georgia. And so we definitely need that diversity here in Gwinnett County. Now interestingly, there are three open seats this year. We have two Superior Court seats and we have a State Court seat. And if people are interested in diversity, they have the opportunity this year to vote in three different black women into those three different seats. Veronica Cope, who is running for the other Superior Court seat, myself, again, Superior Court, B.T. Parker. What's her name again? Veronica Cope. C-O-P-E, yes. Okay. Myself, B.T. Parker, P-A-R-K-E-R, -E and then also Rhonda Colvin Leary. 
So if people are interested in diversity, they do have the opportunity this year to elect black women to the bench. Okay, which is perfect, which is what we need, because again, Gwinnett County. <laughs> Let me ask you another question. Sure. Once you win, once again, you're sitting on the seat. This is a question I would like to ask a lot of judges, but I can't, so I'm gonna ask you. <laughs> Lucky me. All right. Today is my day. <laughs> Today is your day. One of the questions I ask, how would you judge minorities that come before you, that come before, let me try it again. How would you judge minority that come before your bench that you know in the past have been handed down an unjust sentence prior to the current charge they have been charged with at the time they're before you? How, how would you judge them when you know that sentence prior to them was an injust as when that county off the hands down. I cannot to minorities. Okay. I, I cannot go back and undo what was done in terms of someone's sentence. What I can do is judge fairly in terms of the case that's before me. And as your judge I will definitely do that. I promise to be fair, I promise to be impartial. And I can say that because in the past I have represented both plaintiffs and defendants. So when I am in court, I will zealously represent a plaintiff. I know their position through and through, and that's the position I'm advocating for. If it's a defendant, I will advocate for that position. So I know that I can be fair, um, which brings me to another point. Those who have not represented both plaintiffs and defendants, they cannot, I don't see how they can be fair. I just don't. Um, but again, I have been fair in the past and I have the experience to justify it as I have represented both sides. So I can handle the case that is before me, I can judge fairly um, and that's what I am committed to doing. Okay. Which brings me to my next question. How would or do you feel knowing you have to go by the letter of the law because I've heard, I've seen a lot of this happening to um, people that I know, close friends of mine, minorities, a lot of minorities talk about it, they pull it up in case law. So I'm going to ask you this question. How would you feel, or how do you feel, knowing you have to go by the letter of the law, using a defendant's past criminal history that they have already served time for, and you have to sentence them according to the guidelines giving them more time for a crime they already served time for and the one they are being charged with now. And I've seen Paul Howard, Paul, what's that, um, Fulton County District Attorney. Paul Howard. Paul, Paul Howard. Uh -huh. And I've, I've seen him advocating lately, all this week actually, when he talk about something that surprised me, being a district attorney, how he wants to stop, try to stop the application, the applicants from asking about non felonies, not felonies, but non violent felonies on how they can't get a job or they can't get an apartment, they can't get nothing once they're released. And one of the things I do know through, um, th through research, I know London, a lot of countries, but I know London is one of them, England over there. When you do a crime over there, once you serve your time, all of your rights are restored. But over here in America, the most things that lock up a lot of minorities, when they do a crime, and they could go do a pettiest crime or just be falsely accused like a lot of them do, and they have to be forced into a plea agreement because you come at them with so much time. Because the crime that they did, they still doing time for. So how would you feel, because I know some federal judges talked about this, how would you feel when you got to go by the letter of the law and judge someone for something small that they're before your superior court, yet you still have to sentence them based on their past to bring it up with their present charge and then give them more time than what they charge currently would give them if they was not a felon? And it seems like there it is, and let me tell you why. Because it seems like it's compound. Um, there, there are a lot of things there, and I don't know the specific situation um, that you're referring to. 
Um, if I had more information, I'd be able to give you um, a more thorough answer. But because I don't know the particulars of that particular situation, I wouldn't be able to answer that. I don't know what they do um, overseas. Um, but what does concern me, though, if someone has um, some kind of uh, record that um, is not supposed to be divulged um, in terms of, for instance, people get arrested and there, there's no conviction, for instance, and that's problematic if an employer is requesting that information. That is unfair, that's illegal, and it shouldn't be that way, but also, um, People need to make sure that they have the right attorney representing them. You know, there are certain things that are excluded um, in motions in limine, um, or um, we call them motions in limine, motions to exclude information, motions to exclude certain things um, that should not come before the court. So a lot of times, unfortunately, it deals with the attorney who is representing them, and that attorney needs to make sure that that particular information is not brought forth in trial, whether it's a jury trial or a bench trial. So, you know, as a judge, it is my responsibility to rule um, if that information is admissible into evidence or not. Right. And you having to go by the letter of the law, take that criminal history, compound it with that current charge. That current charge just says a mess, mis, uh, um, not a misdemeanor, but it's marijuana, which is, could be a in between your class C and what's a class C misdemeanor or class, what, a class A felony, something like that? Depending on the amount. Right, depending on the amount, but it's something minor. However, because of their background, that's the number one thing what a lot of people take plea agreements for. And they take the plea agreement because they know if they go before a trial, which they possibly could be, they are forced, forced into this plea agreement because they don't want to take the chance of fighting, fighting the uh, United States or fighting the state, which will be you. And that's one of the things that a lot of people like to know about because that, that continuous time. But we're going to move forward to this next question I have. But before you say that, that before we move on, um, you indicated fighting the state, which could be me. I, I'm not in the DA's office. Oh, okay. I'm not in the ADA's office. I'm not in the solicitor's office. So um, I just want that to be clear that um, I have never been in an office which has prosecuted. Okay. Well, this, your opponent, brings me to your opponent. Your opponent is a career assistant district attorney who has dedicated her entire career to putting people in jail. Let me say that again. Who has dedicated her entire career to putting people in jail. And of course, minorities always have to step. They go before the judge. That's why it's so important May 22nd, everybody get out and vote. But you have a lot of minorities, and I've seen in quite a few friends of mine to go before the district attorneys, especially here in Gwinnett County. And you have had some um, some um, judges that have their cases overthrown, overturned, and some district attorneys because of injustice and because of the things that they did done. However, how do you feel about what difference are you going to make if you had a district attorney sitting before you when you know their entire life they dedicate to putting minorities in jail? Well, I think that's problematic in terms of someone being on the bench, being fair and impartial. Again, if you have only represented the state in terms of convicting or bringing charges against people your entire career, you've never represented defendants. Uh, for instance, then how can you be fair and impartial? Um, I, on the other hand, I have represented plaintiffs and defendants um, in both civil cases and in criminal cases, um, and criminal cases in terms of defending them. So um, I don't understand how someone can be fair and impartial when you've only been on one side of the V. And when I say one side of the V, that means um, always representing the state um, in terms of bringing a, a suit against a particular defendant. So the state versus um, John Smith, for instance. So I, I find it difficult to understand how someone can be fair um, and impartial, again, if they've only represented one side their entire career. Because their, their job is to convict. 
that. By any means necessary, basically. Their job is to convict, and they are, they have um, various, um, I guess their performance is based up on their Conviction rate. Conviction rate. Yeah, their performance, I mean, that's their performance just, is based upon their conviction rate, just like anything else. That's what they're paid to do, so yes. That's what they're paid to do. Even if at some point in time, injustice had to be handed out. Their performance is based on their conviction rate. Okay. Well. And, and, and you can take from that what you will. <laughs> <laughs> men and Latinos, um, quite frankly, studies have shown that they are many times uh, sentenced two to three times more harshly than their white counterparts. It, so, it, you know, I, 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 I like to, I wasn't going to touch that, but you touched it, so I'm just going to kind of expound on it. I noticed recently in the past decade, mm -hmm. Latinos have been coming up in the same category with black men and they say we are overpopulating the judicial system the prison system more but I like to just beg to differ a little bit black has been targeted since the beginning of time and I don't think anybody they might be behind us a couple of notches but I don't think anybody has been served more unjust sentences than black men than black boys. And now they are targeting our black women. Because if you look up in the system, 300% more black women are now being incarcerated. And back then, you never heard about black women being incarcerated. But now they're targeting them. Now, of course, you can say, what well, they doing crime? A lot of them don't. They get caught up in situations that they're placed in, that they can't fight their way out. And then they're not having a good sentence. So, only thing I'm gonna touch on that is to go to the next question. Is, I understand Latinos are like us, was well, similar to us. I'm not gonna say like us, similar to us. They do get certain handed down unjust sentences. They are targeted, but no race of man, to my knowledge, from my experience, has ever been targeted more than the black man. Even when you go to the shootings, more black men have been shot. For no reason. So a lot of people like to put Latinos now in the same category, which is okay, but it's not okay if you're talking to me, because I'm gonna go by statistics and facts. There's more African American men in the prisons than anybody. There's more African American men been before that Superior Court judge than any other man. Latino may be second, but we have been served in justice so long. I know just a lot of. I just want to put that out there right, because, because a lot it's of them just like not to put fair. That. It's not right. fair. Justice does not appear to be blind, and unfortunately, right. um, you know, there is a saying, and again, it's unfortunate. I have heard, you know, you go to Gwinnett on vacation and you leave out on probation. Exactly. <laughs> so I have heard that it's unfortunate, um, and I'm committed to making sure that that does not happen not on my watch right. um for those who are um, should be treated differently uh, i am committed to fairness right okay one of the questions i'm gonna ask because this means your world of the past well still kind of mine yours of the past real estate you know how we loved it we adored it we made money off of it we embraced it and Absolutely. we 
you know, it was a good, it's, it's a good thing. I've been in here since the 1990s, I think it was as well, when we met. One of the things I want to ask, in 2008, the market crashed. The market crashed our industry. And we had a lot of people in our profession, be you an attorney, be you a broker, be you an agent, be you an appraiser, be you an investor. Absolutely. That's um real estate attorney, by the way. Had a lot of people in me and your profession. And when that market crashed, a lot of them started going to jail because of fraud. A lot of lives was ruined and a lot of loans were defaulted as well. Now, it seems like the economy is picking up on the real estate side, or, or, or the home home uh, purchasing, commercial side as well. And now that it's picking up, how would you feel if history repeated itself and you had those licensed professionals come before you for sentences, sentencing? How would you, would you be lenient on them or oppose, oppose lenient, more lenient for them opposed to a drug dealer? Or would you be more harsher? Oh, of course we know we're going to go by the letter of the law. But as the judge, as I know, the judge makes the decision. And a lot of judges, especially the ones in Gwinnett County, they don't go by the letter of the law. Because I know that because I've been in a litigation suit and they just totally... Just say, forget all that. This is what we're going to do. <laughs> so, how would you feel? Would you, tough question, be lenient on them? Because that was once your background, opposed to being more harsher on a drug dealer. How would you case that? Well, a lot of times, um, it's not about someone's guilt or innocence in a particular situation, a lot of times it's how guilty they are, how innocent are they. For instance, um, judges have a lot of discretion in terms of will they get one a one-year sentence or will they get a three-year sentence. So, um, you know, that depends on their representation, the attorney that's representing them, and then after hearing the facts, um, it would be at my discretion to determine sentencing at times. And again, I would be fair across the board. I don't know the, any particular facts, but uh, this is a hypothetical um, and a very real one because I, I do remember um, a lot that happened back in 2009 and around that time, and how you know some of that is coming to light now. So it, it's a very real um, hypothetical, right? And, and again, I can, that's all I can do is just be fair um, and take everything into consideration. Right. Well, it's very real, especially in that industry. I mean, a lot of people do a lot of things. Um, let me ask you this here. Drug dealers often have the harshest sentences. And recently, Donald Trump, the president, the president um, stated that because of this opium, the heroin addiction, that now that carried over to the whites. He's saying drug dealers should get the death penalty. The death penalty, that's kind of harsh. Because I know when, and he's saying the people that's on, he's saying the people that's on drugs, since they're white, they should be some type of treatment. They should be treated, uh, get some type of treatment and everything. So, with the drug dealers coming before you, people who selling drugs, well, and, and, and you know, you need to go by the letter of the law. If they out there doing crime, of course, you got to be here, ready to face the time. However, how would you feel when the president is saying the drug dealers should get the death penalty? So does that mean they need to be? If you got a decision to make, they could get one year, or a maximum sentence, ten years. How would you gauge on your judgeship and saying, hey, how would you think you'll feel about that? Two things. Um, one, a lot depends on what has happened. For instance, if someone died as a result of that drug dealer um, dealing drugs, um, if this was his first offense, if this was his fifth offense or whatever. So there's a lot that goes into that um, that needs to be taken into consideration. 
Um, and interestingly, just this past week or within the last two weeks, um, there was a, an episode um, with regard to that on the news. So, you know, there's a lot that needs to be done in this country in terms of the op opioid um, addiction. Yes, I, I agree. I agree. And because it's now um, hitting other populations more so than necessarily the black community, um, it has become first and for, uh, first and forefront. So from the president all the way down, they are trying to do things at this point. Yeah, they are. They are trying to do things. Yeah, well, when crack was out, the thing that that was done was mass incarceration. Let's go to the next question. Gwinnett County. My business is here. Your business is here. I live here. My daughter was raised here. You raised yours here. And we've been here 20 plus years. Hello, I'm Erica O'Neill with Pinpoint Brokers, and I'm here to drive you to success. The golfer is taking some time off to take his talents to the Arnold Palmer Invitational. But don't worry, you're all in good hands. Here at Pinpoint Brokers, we want your business to be successful. And success starts with me finding you the perfect commercial space. Landing in the right location is great, but you must have a representative with the right tools to get you there. Pinpoint Brokers, we don't just put you in a space, we actually educate you on how we're going to get you there. If you're looking to lease your commercial property or find tenants for your vacant commercial space, come visit us and let us point you in the right direction. You can visit us online at pinpointbrokers.net or on social media at Pinpoint Commercial Underwriters or Pinpoint Foundation. Actually, I love this county. That's why I haven't left it. But one thing about Gwinnett County is in its past. It's been predominantly white and ran by whites. Always, always displaying prejudice to African Americans and other minorities. And oftentimes, cases are, have been overturned because they found the, the arresting officer or judge or district attorney to be racist and framing defenders. How would you handle a case where the officer or district attorney or judge or somebody of office who dedicated they to, and pledged their life and said, I'm here to protect and serve fairly, they was found to be framing someone because of that race, and then they came before your judgeship? How would you sentence them? Again, with regard to... Um people who are in places of position and power who should know better, and I, I guess that's what I think you're getting at, they should know more so than other people because this is what they're in charge, they're entrusted with, the um, welfare of the community in which they are supposed to serve. And are you asking if they would be judged more harshly or if they would be judged um, as a regular citizen? Help me to understand more. I'm asking you, would they be judged more harshly, like when you had drug dealers for selling one crack rock, they was judged more harshly than somebody white that got 10 kilos of cocaine and they sitting on a quarter million dollars and this young man or young woman or crackhead, somebody who probably got on drugs, they, they was judged more harshly than someone who got 10 kilos of drug of dope. How, how, how would you feel about that? And they're before you, and you know they'll frame somebody. And that person's life was taken. You can't give that time back. 
And you don't know what prison did to them on the inside. Now this person is before you. He's been found or she's been found guilty. Would you be lenient because they once served office? Or would you be harsher because it's within the guidelines. We're going to always stay within the letter of the law. Or it's within the guidelines. Like with a crackhead, he could have got 10 days, but they gave him 10 years. If someone sold cocaine, he could have got one year, or he could have got 20 years. They gave him one year, they gave the crackhead, the man on crack, 10 years. So now this person is before you. I am committed to making sure that those who come before me are treated fairly. And I'm committed to making sure that happens because I have an understanding about the system, how the system works. I understand that many times um, people of color are treated very differently within that system. And so I would make sure that that person is given a fair shake. Again, I've done plaintiff's work and I've also done defense work. Right. So I would make sure that both sides are presented. I rule fairly on that. And that's also, again, why we are strongly, strongly, strongly ask the citizens of Gwinnett County to come out so that they can have diversity on the bench, so that they can have a diversity of ideas, so that they can have a diversity of backgrounds, so that they can have a diversity of experiences um, and ethnicities. So I, I am committed to that 100%. And one last question. Our president, he's advocating drug dealers should get the death penalty. Drug dealers should get the death penalty. What's your take on that? Agree or disagree? Just simple. It's it's not as simple as that. Not, no, let, let, let me rephrase it. Please. Drug dealers get the death penalty. But nobody has died. Okay. Nobody okay. was forced to purchase the drugs. Nobody was killed. No children involved. Mm -hmm. Just a drug dealer to another grown individual who wanted to purchase, who wanted to sell. They met, it happened. That individual, according to the president, he said, all, oh, he didn't distinguish like I did. Well, I'm going to give a distinguished one. He said and, they should have. And I appreciate that. Um, you he said they should have the death penalty. Right. There are times in which people say things that are not for them to say. Someone who is in the executive branch should do what they do do things that are within the realm of the executive branch. The judiciary, however, is the group of individuals who make decisions in terms of sentencing. And so, you know, we can all have our opinions, but last I knew, um, President Donald Trump is not a judge. And he can say what he wants to say, but, you know, truth be told that we have rules in place. We have laws in place here in Georgia. And last I checked, it did not say that just because you're a drug dealer, you should be sentenced to death. But let me bring up just one other quick thing. Um, I had the pleasure of speaking with the current judge who has been um, in the seat for over 20 years. And she recently received a death penalty case. So Is and she I, the she? Yes. Oh, okay. And I am claiming that once I am judge sitting in her seat, I will be hearing that death penalty case. Mm. And so again, it's important that people come out to vote because they need to understand that the death penalty is real here in Georgia. Uh, just last week on March 15th, uh, Carlton Gary was um, executed here in Georgia by lethal injection. And uh, Georgia has been, has had the death penalty since 1735. So it, it's very real, and again, just eight days ago, someone was executed here in Georgia, and that is a, a death penalty case is one that will be coming um, before my court, and again, I do speak that into existence. Yes, I will too. Speaking of death penalty, I'm from Texas. Death penalty, of course, you know, that's the number one place to go get rid of you. And Georgia's number four. In number terms four? Of, yes. Ask me a question. Do I believe in the death penalty. Do you believe, Mr. Menefee, in the death penalty? Me being a spiritual guy, reading scripture, I absolutely do. 
Yeah, if tell a person, me why. If, if a person is found guilty, and I'm not talking about framed, I'm not talking about with the um, with the um, evidence been tampered with, and just sentence passed down. I'm talking about someone you know committed that crime and took lives. For instance, the Florida shooting or something like that? It's the Florida, we could throw the Florida shooting or we could talk about the hangings. Okay. Take, take your pick. I believe in it because I feel like if you're, God gives life and we're here on earth to replenish and to be productive be and, fruitful to be and, multiply. Fruitful and to multiply. Mm -hmm. He didn't give us life to take a life. And that's why he say in scripture, thou shalt not kill. Because scripture is written in the Old Testament and everything in the Old Testament is in the New Testament. It, Jesus didn't come, not to get into that, to do away with, but came to fulfill. And if one go around killing people, I'm not the one to hear to advocate for you to have life when you done took many lives and ruined many families. I'm just not that person to do it. So if a person asks me, they ain't got to like me, it don't much matter. Yes, I'm for it because, no, I'm not the judge, but why should I feel sorry for you when you didn't feel sorry for these people and their family? Because when you took a life, you took a whole family down. You don't know how that person loved one felt about that. And it's a lot of teenagers coming up dead. It's a lot of young um, young um, people, young um, adults coming up there, and because of so so much violence going on, so I'm not the one to sit up here and say, "What?" Well, unless it was in self defense, I'm all for self defense. Let's not get that misunderstood. You pull a gun on somebody, and they exactly, and they killed you. Well, yeah, I'm for that person to get off. They should get off. Because it's how you gonna go out and put you in that person in your life to go and get rid of you because you've been killing other people. I'm gonna mean, use people through some type of form, fake way or fashion. You don't come down to do it. it it's it's routed somewhere else. So as far as the death penalty, if it's a true, if it's a true sentence when a person really committed the crime, and that's what the judge, the sentence that was handed down to them with. I wouldn't go on change.org when someone was advocating to say, hey, we need to save his life. I wouldn't be the one to sign that petition. Because if you was man or woman enough to take that life, you should be man and woman enough to accept whatever consequence came your way. Be it life in prison or the death penalty. So that's how I personally feel about it. You heard it from the man himself, <laughs> J.L. Menifee. <laughs> You're at Pinpoint. <laughs> That's at Pinpoint. Hey, y'all. <laughs> we hope you guys enjoyed this show today. Unless, as you know, go ahead, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, also, I'm just anyone who is interested in being involved in the campaign who is um, socially active, um, please go to btparkerforjudge.com. Again, btparkerforjudge.com. If you want to, um, if you want a yard sign, if you want to go door to door, if you want to call people on the phone, again, please go to btparkerforjudge.com and we appreciate your support. Oh, y'all heard it. And once again, also, is there any kind of way if anybody out there wants to give a donation, what would they have to do? Oh, that would be fantastic as well. Um, this has been a very expensive campaign just to put our name on the ballot. A couple of weeks ago, we had to pay almost $4,000. So we have to pay for advertising and staff, and uh, it's quite expensive. But you can also go to btparkerforjudge.com and reminding everyone to please go down ballot. And what I mean by that is go to the very bottom of the ballot. At the top will be the governors um, who are running, and then at the bottom will be the judicial candidates, and we are nonpartisan. So judges will appear on both the Republican ballot as well as the Democrats ballot. So again, please go all the way down to the bottom of the ballot and vote B.T. Parker. Is it safe to ask you, are you Democrat or Republican? It's irrelevant. It's nonpartisan. Right. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. <laughs> well, y'all heard, heard it, you guys out there. This is Pinpoint Podcast, and, I, and our main thing is we like to come to you and educate you 
on commercial real estate, but today we want to educate you on a good friend of mine running for Superior Court Judge and letting them know you work hard, you could be in this position as well. Work hard to sit on the serve, to serve the public. Instead of being out there complaining about a lot of things, get up, dress yourself up, get out there and vote, or get out there and become a candidate out there. Because it's not like the old days what we get, what we're forbidden to. As y'all can see, B, Ms. B.T. Parker, she's an African-American woman, very intelligent, highly educated, let nothing get in her way of what her dream was. Let nothing stop her what she do, let no obstacles uh, hold her behind. So that's what Pinpoint is all about, is educating. And today the education was about an African-American woman running for judge. Superior Court Judge, in Gwinnett County, which, as she stated, needed. If you don't mind, can you name the three people once again? Veronica Cope is running for Superior Court. B.T. Parker, myself, I am running for Superior Court. And Rhonda Colvin Leary is also um, running, and she's running for State Court. So y'all get out there and vote. May 22nd, Gwinnett County. I know a lot of people only vote when it's time to vote for the president. A lot of us don't even vote for Congress. Let's get out there and vote because we need to start letting our voices be made of all these things that's going on into this society today. I hear a lot of people complaining about it in the barbershops, a lot of people complaining about it at the bars, but nobody actually get out and vote. They have to, and remember, they say our ancestors, or say Martin Luther Kingdom, they fought for us to. Absolutely. They fought for us to vote. And a lot of us young people, well, I'm not young no more, <laughs> but a lot of people my era and younger, they say voting don't matter. Well, actually, vote does matter because it's you who pick the people to serve you. And if you don't get out there and vote, you cannot have a voice and should not have a voice to complain. Whether you like a candidate or not, it don't matter. A lot of people died and stood up for us to be able to vote as minorities, as blacks, African Americans, and whatever title you want to give us, because we done had so many back when I was growing up, we was Negroes, so. Anyway, get out there and vote, May 22nd. If you're down here in Gwinnett County, vote for B.T. Parker for Superior Court Judge. She will be the just judge that we all need. You never know who you're gonna go face, all right? And like you say, if you would like to donate, go to B.T. Parker. For judge.com. For judge.com and always follow us on Pinpoint Pinpoint Foundation. Go to Facebook and follow us or Pinpoint Commercial Underwriters. On Instagram is Pinpoint Brokers. And go to our website, pinpointbrokers.net, if you need any type of commercial real estate need. Because me and Dawson had started way back then when we both were doing residential. I was a broker. She was one of the clothing turners that I use quite frequently. And I know her person. She's always been a good, straightforward, and honest person. Thank y'all for joining Pinpoint Podcast once again. Enjoy y'all weekend. And then this is Mr. Menifee signing off in his hot, TL, hot ATL. And I'm just going to enjoy the rest of this weather. Peace. We out.